All right, I'm uh, David Oberhelman. Uh, I, along with my colleague Barbara Miller, uh, we're the ones that cooked up this idea of a multi-year lecture series commemorating World War I and looking at the legacy of the Great War in the 20th century and beyond. And today we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Justin Prince, who's uh, one of our own uh, OSU uh, PhD, who's going to be getting into some of the actual military uh, technological aspects of the war. We've been looking at a lot of the cultural, social aspects around the war. Here we're going to be looking at actually how the war led to actual changes in engineering and in the um, military technological scene. Now, Dr. Prince is a lecturer currently in the history department here at OSU. And he teaches call, uh, classes on American history, the Second World War, and the Cold War. He received his PhD in 2014 and is a contributor to a 2014 work on uh, a companion to the Muse Argonne Companion, uh, edited by Edward Langle of the University of Virginia. And he's also done design work uh, for interwar and Second World War era naval games published by Matrix Games. So if any of you are interested in uh, war games online, I like done. money, so it's fine. Yeah. And uh, he is currently working on a book focusing on artillery during the First World War. So Dr. Prince, thank All you. Right. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I love to see so many people here. There's already more people here than show up for my night classes, so that's a good sign. Or, I'm sorry, one of the two. So a bit what I want to talk about today is, again, that just military technology side. I, you know, I, like we were talking about earlier, I get the cool stuff. You know, it's the stuff that World War I is known for and the stuff that I'm sure prob you know, a lot of you are probably seeing just now with, what, uh, last month, the release from Electronic Arts of Battlefield I, this first-person shooter game trying to get you know, young people interested in World War I and we're, I'm going to be referencing that quite a bit because it presents how we want to see World War I, not necessarily what is, but rather how we actually would want to see it. So I've titled this lecture The Million Dollar Barrage, which comes from the regimental history of the 111th Infantry Regiment describing the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, when the night before, 2,400 American guns just opened fire, this huge barrage. They called it the Million Dollar Barrage because the fire was so intense. To quote a lieutenant colonel, it was grand, it was beautiful, it was magnificent. A sergeant in the 140th Infantry said it sounded like there were acres of field guns stacked, you know, four high. But that kind of description shows us then the realities of World War I. This is an industrial war. It's not enough simply to have you know, tactics or new tactics or even you know, new doctrines or how we fight or to change. At some level, it's how much can one country produce? Can we produce enough to actually be able to fight the war? Out of the Battle of Verdun in 1916, the Germans came up with a saying, artillery conquers, infantry occupies. And for much of World War I, that's kind of true this idea that this is a war of firepower. And realistically, most nations at the very beginning are entirely unprepared. That's going to lead to problems and casualties throughout the war. And for the United States, kind of sitting it out on the sidelines until 1917, the fact is, even right up through the end of the war, we are completely oblivious to the realities of what this type of war will entail. Uh, we cannot grasp what is going, what it's going to take to fight a war of this magnitude. So to start this out, I was kind of wondering, is there some really cool thing that happens on November 17 with World War I? Some really cool thing to kind of tie this in. And yes, there is. The little known action of November, 19, of November 17, 1917. And what this little, what this battle is, it's, it's not, you're really not going to find it in really any history books. But it marks an important footnote for the United States in World War I and even from a technological perspective. This battle between two American destroyers, the Fanning and the Nicholas, against the German U-boat U-58 marks the first time in history that a U.S. naval warship will sink an enemy submarine. And when you think about that, it really shows exactly what kind of war this is going to be. That this is a war now of new technology. Things like the submarine, the depth charge, 
as dick, sonar. This is a technological world. So I don't want to spend too much time talking, you know, talking about naval stuff. I really want to focus more on land warfare, but it's important to realize that a naval arms race is in large part part of the reason why World War I actually begins. We go from navy, you know, nations building these large fleets of, you know, battleships, of mixed caliber battleships, and, you know, basically competing who can have the bigger navy. And it goes from that, in, you know, the United States. If you look, in the 1880s, the United States has a fairly small navy. We rank 12th. In the 1890s, we rank 7th. In 1900, we rank 3rd. That kind of industrial expansion, especially for the United States, is critical because it shows that we can be a world power. We can compete on the world scale with all of these other nations. But it also shows a problem that's going to belie the United States for the next 18 years. And that is the Navy gets the money. The navies get the good stuff. Okay? The Army will suffer. And then all of this expansion, building these huge ships like the Great White Fleet, which tours the world from 1907 to 1909, comes down to nothing when in 1906 the British commission HMS Dreadnought and at a stroke make every battleship in the world obsolete. The Dreadnought is three nautical miles an hour, three knots faster than every other battleship. Whereas a mixed caliber battleship would have four, you know, 10 to 12 inch guns and a number of smaller ones. The Dreadnought has 10 12 inch guns. This means the Dreadnought has the firepower of two and a half times any other battleship in the world. And Britain has the industrial capability to build these things like crazy. The Germans will try to keep up. Things like the Grosse Kurfürst, you know, they'll try to keep up, but they simply cannot manage the numbers. Britain will have around 38 uh, Dreadnoughts and similar battle cruisers by the outbreak of war. Germany will have something like 24. The United States, we can manage only 10. We sim and even the Oklahoma is not commissioned until after the Great War begins. We can, build, we can build these type of things, but not in the same quantities as others. So what we're going to realize with the United States, although we have had this industrial expansion, okay, we can talk about Gilded Age, the steel, all this stuff. The fact is, okay, we are not prepared for the scale of modern warfare. And the reality is nobody is. Because this is a war of new technology. These are the things that really define the First World War. Things like new breech-loading artillery, quick-firing artillery, machine guns, magazine rifles. This, this type of weaponry defines the First World War but nobody knows how to fight it. And this is the great failing of the first part of the war, is that everybody instead, how do we fight colonial wars? How do we fight imperial wars? To quote a British poet from 1898, okay, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. Colonial troops don't have machine guns. They don't have magazine rifles. They probably don't even have smokeless rifles. So the Maxim gun revolutionizes how militaries fight, but they don't modernize their doctrine. They're used to fighting colonial wars. When we think, you know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking the Zulu War, Anglo-Zulu War, 1870s. The Battle of Rourke's Drift, when a lone British company holds out against thousands of Zulus. It's immortalized the movie Zulu, one of the very first Michael Caine movies. But omitted from the movie are the fact they had Gatling guns. Those are force multipliers. Okay? You're, atta you're being attacked by people with spears and shields. You have Gatling guns. It's going to be pretty clear who wins. Okay? The Maxim gun becomes near universal in European armies. Some of it's going to be just machine guns. Others, they're going to have it more as artillery pieces. Um, others, they're going to have even rechambered from instead machine guns to small little one pound shells of about 30 to 37 millimeters. And they're going to be called pom poms, just really light artillery pieces. But the world doesn't train on how to fight this stuff. 
If you look at the books published around the time, going through the military circles, nobody ever says, how do we take a position defended by machine guns? We can see some, you know, something like that in the 1870s, in the Battle of Gravelot during the Franco-Prussian War, when you know, Prussian troops are taking horrendous casualties from French mitrailleuses or machine guns. And you've got General Phil Sheridan from the United States Army, who is there as an observer. And rather than saying, hey, this presents a problem, he literally says, well, better trained American troops could have done this. This could be something that we could have done. It's simply how Europeans fight. And that's the problem. It's simply passed aside. Because even though we have this new type of weaponry, nobody really investigates. How do you fight this? What can you do with this? What are the problems? We can see that from our own example in the, in the Spanish-American uh, War of 1898. The Americans bring two Gatling guns. That's it. We bring two smaller machine guns, the Colt Browning 1895, seen here at Veracruz, and that's it. You'll have guys like Lieutenant John H. Parker, who commands this Gatling gun detachment at San Juan Hill. Hey, we need machine guns. This is something the Army needs. This is how you fight modern warfare. Even after you get the Maxim and European nations start doing this. In the United States, we say, no, 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 no. Machine guns are emergency weapons. If we have a division of 20,000 people, 50 machine guns will do. That's it. We don't need any more. Literally, we are unprepared for war. But probably the most radical development, especially for World War I, is the, is the creation of a new type of artillery piece, which much like HMS Dreadnought, makes every other type of artillery piece um, obsolete overnight. And it's immortalized, okay? This is, oh, sorry, wrong French 75, sorry, this is what comes after. But I don't know, that might have some of a kick too, but eh, anyways. But this piece, the French 75, the model 1897 field artillery piece. This thing revolutionizes artillery. We see it has a gun shield, which why is that important? Now your artillery crew doesn't have to take casualties from rifle fire. It has a hydropneumatic recoil mechanism, which means that the gun, the barrel, recoils, leaving the carriage right where it was. So you don't have to push the gun back up a couple of feet to reset it after every shot. What this means is not only is your fire more accurate, but you can now shoot much, much quicker. And this gun has a special type of breech, which you can see here, that an experienced gunner could actually hold on to the opening. And as the gun recoiled back, he can open it up, let the maneuver of the gun throw the shell out, so that when the gun reset, the loader can already slap a new round in. Whereas artillery might have managed you know, one, two shots, being muzzle loading, maybe four or five shots per minute with breech loading. You now have a weapon that can have 15 shots per minute. A good crew in short bursts could maybe do 30 shots per minute of accurate aimed artillery fire. This is a game changer for World War I. And again, nobody really puts that much time or effort. How do we actually go about fighting this stuff? What do we need to do? to combat an army do, you know, equipped with pieces that are realistically going to be immortalized by the French, our glorious 75. There's a reason there's a drink cocktail named after this thing, because this is the, probably the best artillery piece of the war. So you have new weapons, machine guns, artillery, new magazine rifles, all of this stuff, but that's only part of the component. The other part is you have to be able to manufacture this and in quantity. Okay, we're not talking about field armies that are fairly small. We're not talking about the American Civil War with one to two million man armies over a five year period. Instead, you're talking about the necessity of equipping three to seven million troops with everything they need in a very, very short amount of time. And the fact is, this is the problem of industry, is that there's simply, you know, the capability is there, but it's not fully understood, not pre-war. Um, just to throw some numbers at you, okay. Uh, for artillery, and again, this is what most of my research is, so it's gonna be a little artillery heavy. We'll get to other cool stuff, though. The British, 
believed that they had a sufficient amount of ammunition already set up prior to the war, that in time of any sort of conflict within six months, factories could churn out an appreciable number of rounds to be able to actually make this work, to be able to fulfill demand. The fact is they couldn't. Within months, they are running out of ammunition. If you look at France, okay, which had a very similar setup, by September 1914, just over one month after war was declared, they had expended two-thirds of all of the artillery ammunition stocks they had. They simply did not have enough. So this then, again, is the problems of industrial warfare. Not only do we have to make new weapons and constantly improve them, make them better, change them to deal with the realities of war, but you have to make enough of them and you have to make enough ammunition, artillery shells, bullets, whatever, in order to be able to actually, you know, supply demand. And especially for the United States, this is going to be the problem. And we'll talk, I'll talk about this in a bit more in a bit. But the problem with the United States, we don't have this industrial setup. We are not set up for a large army. And then even if we were to magically be able to make everything that we needed, whether it be shells or tanks, this is a tank factory in Britain in 1918, we have the problem of you have to put it on ships and bring it to Europe. The problem is the United States simply doesn't have enough transport ships to move everything they need. And the British have no desire to loan us some because they want their own requirements met. The British are more concerned. We want American infantry, not American artillery, not American guns. Okay, we can supply our own needs. We can supply you. We simply need warm bodies because in the War of Attrition, which is Field Marshal Douglas Haig's idea by 1918, okay, the British are simply running out of people. They need warm bodies and they need that more than any material goods the United States could possibly produce. So why do we produce all, the, all of this stuff? Why, you know, with artillery, stuff like that? It's simple, okay? Because one thing begets another begets another. What do I mean? You have all of this stuff, well, you don't know how to fight it. And so with the reality of trench warfare, we see then, okay, we see then that this is simply a war nobody is prepared to fight. Okay, the old 19th century idea, we'll flank them, just simply go around, bypass them. Well, when you have in 1914, what's called the race to the sea, a line of trenches from Switzerland all the way to the North Sea, there's nowhere to go around. You can't go around through Switzerland. You can't amphibious invasion through the North Sea, which leaves you one proposition, going over the top, where infantry on the command of their officer blowing a whistle got up out of their trenches and ran as fast as they could, hoping that if enough of them survived, if enough of them break through to that trench line, that maybe, just maybe, they can force a breakthrough. Because the fact is, even up until 1918, even as this would be the standard scene for the entire war, people thought this will never last. Trench warfare will never last. They clung to the idea of open warfare, that at any point we are going to make a breakthrough. We're going to take that trench line. We're going to have a 30-mile breakthrough, push past all these trenches. Then we can send in the cavalry, and just now we can turn it into a traditional 19th century ba battle. Even after the war, the United States, in most of its field manuals, said trench warfare is an aberration. It's a mistake. This should not happen. Okay? Now, we don't exploit that to the same degree as the Germans will do in World War II, the ideas of Blitzkrieg. Instead, we simply say, look, we're going to be smart. This will never happen again. This was simply a fluke. But it's a fluke that spawns deadly results. New things such as the flamethrower. Uh, and again, you know, what is it Will Rogers will say after World War I? You can't say that human beings never advance. In every new war, they find a new way to kill you. Well, that's borne out by the First World War. The idea get a flamethrower team in the trench, flame the bunkers, burn human beings alive, and maybe you can make guys panic and run, or you can kill everybody in a bunker. If that doesn't work, begin deploying, you know, gas, okay, mustard gas, phosgene gas. This is the first time it's ever done, April the 22nd, 1915, the Second Battle of Ypres. 
Germans just bring up these canisters, wait for the wind to be appropriate, open it up and let it flow over the Canadian lines. And the fact is, in 1915, this was a successful tactic. This actually works. Uh, the Canadians break and run, mo many of them break and run. The only defense they had, and I really don't know where this came from, and students always ask me this, but urinate on a handkerchief, breathe through it, and it provides some measure of defense. Don't want to be the guy that figures that out, but it does work. But the Canadians, it blows a hole in their lines. The Germans weren't expecting this. They don't have enough guys to actually mount an offensive. So they think, okay, hey, this is great. We can try it again, and they do. They open the containers, the wind shifts, and they gas themselves. So 1915, it's a, it's a sketchy proposition. But by 1917, 1918, it's perfected. You can shoot this stuff out of artillery. And gassing is a horrible, horrible way to go. In the case of this American attack during the Meuse Argonne, most of these guys are fine. One guy, however, could not get his mask on. And right now is in the process of drowning as his lungs fill up with fluid and there's nothing much he can do. Mustard gas, beyond attacking the lungs, would burn the flesh and cause these massive chemical burns. And this seems like as bad as it possibly gets. But the fact is, these are not the great killers. The great killers of the First World War are the machine gun and the artillery. Gas is effective, but once you have small box respirators, gas masks, you have an effective counter. It's more of a psychological warfare, you know, psychological warfare than actually something that's going to force military victory. But in the terms of machine guns, artillery, this is quite literally the 19th century meeting the 20th. As French troops marched to battle in 1914, they looked not too dissimilar from the armies of Napoleon. Bright blue uniforms, bright red trousers, which made them excellent targets for German Maxim machine gunners who cut them down in open field. And the Maxim gun, which originally from the 1880s, okay, although the Germans continued to use it, the British updated it into the Vickers heavy machine gun and, the same, and these weapons are going to cause devastating casualties. But even these weapons, I personally don't think, are the biggest killers, simply because there's a limit to how much they can be fired and what they can possibly hit. The big killers are artillery, because a lot of them firing a lot of shells, either shrapnel or high explosive, of calibers from 75 millimeters, so about three inches, all the way to 9.2 inches, firing 60 to 100 pound shells just exploding, that this is what's going to cause the majority of the casualties of World War I. Here big, you know, these big 9.2 inch howitzers. And again, these would not be that common, but they're enough that if a bunker or, you know, part of a trench takes a direct hit from this, okay, it's just gonna collapse. At this point, you're not even talking about outright killing human beings. You're talking about just collapse it in and just bury them alive. Just bury them alive, and when your assault hits the trench, you can just walk over it. You don't even have to worry about it. We're going to see that artillery, being that great killer, okay, we can look at that at the Battle of the Somme, where the British, in this offensive, will fire about 1.73 million rounds of artillery ammunition. Think about that, 1.73 million rounds. But here's the problem with industrialized warfare. They're making so many, and so quickly, to almost, you know, to fairly bad safety standards that probably 20 to 35% of them never explode. Of the 1.73 million that they shoot, 1 million are shrapnel rounds. And people had thought shrapnel, this is the perfect type of artillery shell for open warfare, hitting troops in the open. A 75 millimeter shrapnel round might contain about 270 little round balls, about half an inch in diameter. Now, most of them would be about that. The rest, about 10%, would be these bigger uh, .62 cal you know, 62 caliber round balls, basically Revolutionary War musket balls. And the idea is simple. When it explodes, it's basically a giant shotgun in the air, cutting down infantry, marching in ranks, doing a bayonet charge, things like this. But that's not the reality of World War I. This is useless in trench warfare. This does nothing. 
You need high explosive things producing these giant shell fragments, which the, the bursting force not only destroys bunkers, but that might actually cause damage. The problem is it's expensive and complex to manufacture. And so the overwhelming majority of artillery shells made in World War I are shrapnel. And despite that, artillery will probably kill more people than any other form of weapon in the First World War. And you know, just to give you an idea of manufactured numbers, the United States, we're going to make about 5 million rounds of artillery ammunition. Four will be shrapnel. Only about 942,000 will be high explosive. And then again, to show how bad the United States is, of that, 6,000 rounds, that's it, makes it to France by the end of the war. Only 6,000 rounds. Everything else we have to buy from France. I want to sidestep this, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I should mention from a technological point, probably one of the you know, best things that comes out of the war, both best and worst, is the development of aircraft. 1903, you get powered flying. But World War I accelerates this probably by about 30 years. That's probably the best estimate I've seen. You get in 1914 the Vickers gun bus, the first ever plane designed to carry weapons. Before this, okay, if a military was going to use a plane, your weapon would be a pistol or a carbine. Bombs would be to drop hand grenades out of the side. That's about it. But here, you now have a, wep a, you know, a weapon that you can fly over, observe enemy positions, and then you know, actually be able to you know, either get the information back or possibly shoot down enemy planes. But that concept's perfected with the Fokker Eindecker, the first true fighter plane in the world, because it includes what's called an in interrupter gear. So it can have that machine gun sitting on top of the cowling. And as it fires, what happens, there's a cam system that as the propeller crosses in front of the machine gun, the gun stops firing. As soon as it moves, it fires again. And the idea is simple. Now you don't have to worry about flying the plane and aiming the gun, but instead you can just simply aim the entire weapon system. And this, uh, this takes time. It's, it's time. It starts in 1915. Uh, there's going to be a German fighter ace, Max Immelmann, who will actually shoot himself down because his interrupter gear fails and he shoots off his own propeller. But by 1917, 1918, this actually works. This is a good weapon system. And we're going to see, realistically, the I shouldn't say joke, but the saying would be the life expectancy of a Royal Flying Corps pilot would be about 20 minutes because planes are actually devastating. And we can see that with things like the Hanley Page 0400, which a similar plane will be one of the first to circumnavigate the globe. Okay, being able to fly, it not, it's not nonstop, but it can actually fly around the world in the 1920s. You go from flimsy planes that might weigh 1,000 pounds, 1,200 pounds, to planes that can actually carry a half ton bomb load and possibly more. And again, this is development that would not have come without World War I. But again, with that, it's also deadlier. Because now with planes like the German Gotha, you are now have the capability to bring war to civilians. Not gone now are the days where one army simply fights another in the field. Now there's a possibility, and it's actually demonstrated several times, where you can bomb enemy cities. Gothas will bomb London. German Zeppelins will bomb London. And now civilians become legitimate targets. And then that idea is perfected until we get to World War II, where unfortunately this is done wholesale. But now for the cool stuff. And the cool stuff, and I say this because of just our modern impression. Okay, this is a still from this new game, Battlefield One. This idea, oh, you've got tanks in the desert, tanks being this just staple component of warfare. And that's true today, but not, in, not until 1918 and even then only sparingly. Okay, for one thing, these tanks are really, really badly designed. I'm sure some of you guys like to work on cars. Well, what does an exhaust do? It vents gases from the engine out of the vehicle, which ranks up there with the idea of well duh. In the British, on most British tanks, the exhaust simply vented the gases back into the crew compartment. So literally, you're driving in an enclosed steel box with no air conditioner, internal temps up to about 120 degrees, choking on your own fumes. 
The, so again, when we see stuff like this, as much as I love the game, tanks would not have been in the desert because the crew would literally have been roasted alive. But we instead want to say, well, we have tanks today, we have tanks then, certainly it must have been the same way. The fact is we don't get the first idea of a workable tank until September 1915, Little Willie, which is a name, a pun on Kaiser Wilhelm. And it's not very functional, but it's a prototype that lets the British work out the majority of the kinks. So that by that next year, you can field the Mark I. And the Mark I is the first combat effective tank in the world. Now by combat effective, I mean its reliability, you got about a 50% chance of it breaking down before it even gets to the start line. Um, you're still gonna be choking on fumes, it'll probably break down after a few miles, and even a portly gentleman such as myself could outrun one. But it nonetheless presents a new possibility of being able to break through trench warfare because you don't really have anti-tank weapons. Okay? Not to mention, imagine, it's the Somme Offensive. Okay, you've never seen, you probably haven't even seen that many cars. And then this lumbering monster with between four to 10 machine guns, possibly two six pounder cannon lumbers towards you. This would have been a terrifying sight. By 1918, they're getting more common. The British will build about 2,400. But early on, okay, this is a new novel concept. And the British begin expanding it. We'll get things like the Mark V Star, which is improved in two ways. One, it can cross trenches better. But the other, this is the origin of the battle taxi concept, still used by militaries today, of an armored personnel carrier that can deliver a squad of infantry into combat and protect it from artillery and machine gun fire. But it doesn't work, why? Because that same exhaust fume problem, so when the guys bail out, in most cases they would literally start throwing up. They're, they're, they're not gonna go fight anytime soon. But it's the idea, we can now start doing that. But here also is the problems of industry. Whereas the British will build about 2,800 tanks, the Germans build a grand total of 20. And so it's because that we have to, the Germans have to capture any British or French tank they possibly can because the Germans simply build it way too big. The Sturmpanzerwagen A7V, this is it for German tanks. And the funny thing is, I actually have a funny story about this. One of these actually survives in Australia because Australia is close to Europe. And the reason for that is simple. One was knocked out in 1918 and a bunch of Australians who had been drinking, which I think that's what they do anyway, said, I'm drunk, let's go steal a tank. And so they go into no man's land without orders, steal a tank, and that is why we have one preserved, even working A7V. The French are going to build numbers of tanks some like this, the saint Chamond, which it's, you know, this would be more akin to a World War II tank destroyer, but probably the most famous tank is the Renault FT. And the reason it's famous beyond the fact that we use it is it is the first tank in the world with a turret. Whereas the Germans just have one big gun, you have to aim the whole tank. The British say, let's have two. The French say, why don't we build a small, fast tank with one gun that you can turn 360 degrees. This is basically how tanks today are still made. But it's kind of funny, if you look from 1916, people wondered, well, if we're doing this then, what are we going to do in the future? And so there's an article from Popular Science that gives us an idea of these huge 100-story giant tractor wheels, or maybe let's have a battleship on treads. The money ran out because it's not practical, but people said, hey, maybe. Maybe we can do this. So what I want to do now is start talking about the American participation. This is now the war. Planes, artillery, machine guns, tanks. How do we approach that? And the fact is, we don't. Again, as I mentioned, the United States Army in 1914 said that machine guns were emergency weapons, which means that we don't have one standardized. One of the more common, the Benet Merci, Model 19-9, was known as the daylight gun because it so frequently jammed and broke down, you could only shoot it in daylight because there's no way you're getting this thing reassembled at night. It's just not gonna happen. Um, we're gonna see we have new rifles, the Model 19-3 Springfield, 
but we only build 600,000 because it never occurs to us, even as late as 1914, as the war begins, that maybe we're going to need more weapons. We have two arsenals in operation, Springfield and Rock Island. Rock Island, the year the war breaks out, shuts down. Springfield has been out of operation for about four years and only now just restarts. Our artillery pieces are so few and far between that we don't even have really good workable ones. We have 930 of six types. Okay, 930, to put this in perspective, on a 25,000 yard front at the Somme Offensive, the British could mar uh, marshal 800 of one type. Okay, so 800 on a 25,000 uh, yard frontage, so about 14 miles. In the United States, of six types, of all different calibers, we have 930. And they're old and obsolescent, and they're not fit for modern service. Unfortunately, the best way we can see that this would be the standard artillery piece, we'll talk about this one a lot here in a bit, the only one of ours that will actually go overseas and fight. And it's really cool if we actually have one here at OSU. In front of the ROTC building, we have one of these. The 4.7 inch gun, model 19.6. This is our heavy field gun. And we send 42 to France. That is the only pre-war American artillery piece to actually be used in the Great War. And to quote the chief of artillery, their history doesn't make for pleasant reading. Oops, you know, literally, we produce this stuff, but we can't decide on what we want to make. And so the result is, even as the war bring, you know, begins, we don't start saying, well, we might get involved, we might need to beef up our army, we don't do that. Even by 1916, instead, we start testing new stuff. And so the um, industry in the United States is simply going to be overwhelmed. And we can see that, I think, if we look at just the problems in you know, what's actually going on at American industry. The fact is we're producing orders for Britain already. Places like the Eddy Stone Rifle Plant, which was a subdivision of Remington Arms, which was opened in the Baldwin Locomotive Works. You know, here they are in 1918 drumming up support. But the problem is, okay, they're producing British stuff. We need them to produce American stuff. There's simply not enough American factories to produce everything that we need. There's not enough to produce in the quantities that World War I dictates. There's just simply not enough. And so it's because of that you actually have fighting between the chief of artillery and the head of the ordnance department. To quote William J. Snow, that chief of artillery, I was after guns and not hell. And so because of that, they can't figure out exactly what to do. We're going to war. That's pretty obvious by 1916. Okay, we need whatever we have, so let's build what kind of stuff we have now. Instead, right then we say, no, let's experiment. Let's create a new field artillery piece, completely redesign it, then change the caliber of it, and then be surprised when it breaks when you actually try to use it. This is what Ameri the United States Army dubbed the crime of 1916 the 75 millimeter gun, model 1916. It is this three inch gun, model 19.2, with a redesigned uh, front, a redesigned carriage system, and then when we get involved in the war, the French send a mission to the United States and say, hey, don't introduce a new caliber onto the Western Front. The British use the 18 pounder shell. We use the 75 millimeter shell. You need to use one of ours so that we can make your ammunition. Rather than just simply saying, okay, let us build what you have, or okay, let's just rechamber what we have to your ammunition. To quote again Snow, the US Army had to feel like we contributed something. So we spend millions of dollars designing this piece. We build all of 250, most of them don't work, most break in training, and we send one to France where it's destroyed literally about an hour after it gets there because they try to tow it behind a horse and it falls apart. I literally wish I was making this up. That's how bad it is. We have a better choice. We have two factories in the United States, Midvale Steel and Bethlehem Steel, building 18 pounders for the British Army. Okay? We literally could have rechambered this into 75 millimeter, and we do. We call it the Model 1917 but the American Army doesn't want it. 
And so it's never built in appreciable quantities. And what we're going to see is in many cases, the army says, well, okay, we want this artillery piece. The United States says, no, 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 we want to build this. Well, no, we'd actually really like that. No, you're going to build this. As late as March 1918, okay, quite literally, okay, the armistice is coming in a few months. We are still haggling what type of gun we want to take to war. And the reason for that is quite simple. The Army believed that the United States Army would have to take over running of the war. I don't have any pictures of this because it's theoretical. But we'd have to believe, we believe we'd have to take over the running of the war, that the British and French were simply going to be too tired and have to give up. So we say, okay, in 1919, we're going to take control. We're going to fight it out starting in 20, and we're going to fight it out to the finish. So we believe we've got a couple of years to build all of this stuff to get ready. And the fact is, because of that, because of that squabbling, the United States industrial system simply completely fails. No new American gun will go to France after the war begins. In fact, American industry will build a grand total of 705 field artillery pieces from April the 6th, 1917, when we declare war, to November 11, 1918. Quite 705, that is it. Again, at the same time that the British are able to put 800 guns on a 14-mile front, we simply can't compete. So what is the American experience then? Simple. We have to beg, borrow, and steal everything we can possibly get. We have to basically have an American army equipped with whatever we can get. Some photos from my own pri private collection, probably the best, you know, the most recognizable thing after the Brody helmet would be the model 1917 Enfield made by that Eddystone plant. But in this case, these were British pattern 1914 Enfields. These are British guns made for British contracts that when we declare war, we say, okay, we're going to rechamber it to the American service ammunition. We're going to issue that because the government arsenal can't produce enough American rifles. The best way to see that is if you look at the bayonets, the pattern 1913 issued with this, you can see that the British markings were simply just struck through and a very sloppy US stamped on it, just to know that this is not for that British contract. Probably mo you know, even more telling, this picture from Camp Dix in Texas of a British um, soldier training an American soldier in bayonet tactics. But he's holding a rifle that fought in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War, the 1898 Craig Jorgensen. This is the type of, you know, military that we're going to war with. Probably the, you know, to show exactly how unprepared, this is an American training artillery piece. And I've got a really cool story here, if I can find the whole thing. I buried it here, and there we go. Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. So what these guys do from the Indiana Field Artillery, okay, what they decide to do is they literally want to be mustered into federal service. They don't want to wait to, hey, we're going to get drafted. They want to go. So they want to train on artillery. So what do they do? They go to a circus and they get a couple of big wagon wheels. They go to, uh, you know, junkyards and try to find old seats and axles from cars. They get lumber to try to cut it up to make the carriage of the gun. And then they literally break off somebody's uh, porch uh, post to use as a barrel. And they literally try to make this into whatever type of field artillery piece they could. It's horrendously crude, but this is all the U.S. Army can do. We simply don't, early on, have the industrial base to make this happen. How do we train for tanks? Well, we don't have that many cars, so let's do what every kindergarten child wants to do and let's make one out of wood. Okay, literally, we're not building log cabins, we're building log tanks. But this is all we can really do. And it's realistically so ineffective that American troops have to be retrained when they get to France in 1918. And in many cases, there's a bottleneck. Because at one point, okay, between training and the fact there's just simply not enough guns okay, for artillery, we're going to procure about 3,600 from France a few more from Britain. But the fact is we can only equip maybe 70% of all of the units we have drafted into service. We're planning to field 80 divisions by 1919. 
were planning for a one million man army in 1919. But the fact is, the war is in 1918. And we see then that you know, during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which you know, again begins with that million dollar barrage of French 75s firing here, or French 155 millimeter guns firing here. You know, literally, you're gonna have a senator from New Jersey go on the Senate floor of the United States in 1919 and declare that American boys were slaughtered like sheep because lack of artillery. Our guys were good. Okay? They knew how to fight. They wanted to fight. They're in more high spirits than the French. The French army mutinies at one point. Okay? We're you know, better able to do this than the British. But we simply don't have the resources. So if you look at the American, you know, the American infantry at the time, he, he looks kind of a mixed mash of stuff. He's carrying a British-designed rifle, wearing a British helmet, but carrying a French light machine gun. So what we're going to see is, I mean, using that, using things like the Hotchkiss or machine gun or George Patton having to drive a Renault FT or American artillery using French railway guns. Okay, the American army, we commit soldiers, but not necessarily materiel. So it might sound like, well, then what do we learn from this? What is it we get out of this? The fact is, although the United States might not be ready for war when it comes, we're going to use that experience to create a new style of warfare after World War I. Because we start innovating, we start building these huge factories. Like, you know, the um, town of Nitro, West Virginia, springs up around the second largest um, ammunition plant in the United States. We start looking at some of these problems and say, if we can't fix them in World War I, we're going to fix them for later. Okay, things like the French Show Show, okay, the standard light machine gun given to American troops, which, to quote my favorite person, Arlie Ermey, is the kind of gift you want to give back because this thing is crudely made. It works fine for the French Army, but when you rechamber it from 8mm LaBelle to 30-06, 30 caliber model 19-6, and then you have it machined in a bicycle shop. Literally, the way the weapon designs is when you fire it, if you're not holding it properly, it will jam. Literally, these things jam up all along the lines. American troops, once they jam up, tend to just throw them away. But instead, we're going to say, no, we can do better. We can build American weapons that can actually be better. We'll get things like the Peterson device. Make the service rifle a semi-automatic carbine. Now, this is never issued in quantity in 1918, but we could have put a million of these into the field in 1919 had the war continued. And that's going to be really the theme for the rest of this, had the war continued. We're going to create things like the Browning Automatic Rifle, you know, the first really good squad light machine gun. It's done by John Moses Browning, and this is actually his son, Val Browning, in France, modeling the weapon. There's just a problem. It was too good. The Ordnance Department said, well, we really don't want the Germans getting this and using it against us, so we're not actually going to use them. Literally, we create new weapons. We finally contribute something and say, no, 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 we don't want this used against us. But we take these types of weapons and we experiment after the war. We develop new stuff. We learn from our failures. We start doing things like how do, can we put a gun on a tank chassis and drive it around? the 105 millimeter howitzer motor carriage? Can we put a gun on a truck and shoot down planes? And we're gonna see then the army realizes, how can we use this stuff to have truly this concept of open warfare? And the British do this too. I mean, the British, we get the 60 pounder gun carrier, Mark II, the first actual self-propelled artillery piece. But it will be the United States throughout the interwar period that will actually refine the concept. And you know, we'll even you know, test out various different types of tanks. The Ford three ton, which is kind of stupid looking, but you know, hey, a guy in a machine gun, why not? Um, the Ford six ton, which is basically the Renault FT, and a tank that I guarantee every one of you have seen, the Mark VIII Liberty. This would have been the tank for 1919, but it's not really built in that much quantity. But then in the 1980s, when for a movie, Steven Spielberg needs a tank, he builds a mock-up, puts a turret on it, and then realizes that that cannot kill Indiana Jones. Literally, the tank from Indiana Jones' Last Crusade is based off the Liberty tank. And then I like this picture because I don't know why you'd put a tank on another one, but hey, whatever. So, you know, we're testing it, that's what we 
If thousand dollar hammer, you got to do something with it, right? But what does all this then mean for the United States Army? We take this stuff and we realize, okay, we're not going to make the same mistakes. We're actually going to test tanks throughout the 1930s. We're not going to adopt good ones. You know, one, the Christie, which are these tanks here on the right, the Soviets will use. And at some point, it'll get so bad that the army has to lie to Congress. Oh, no, no, we don't want tanks. We want combat cars. That's what we're going to call them. But we still try to test so that in World War II, we can perfect everything we have learned. And so in World War II, we actually use howitzer motor carriages, self-propelled artillery. We blend the ideas of firepower with open warfare. We even take those French 75s that we're using from the French that are still lying around, put it in a half track. Hey, boom, we gave it mobility. We can actually make this work. Need something bigger? Take those 155 millimeters we've got lying around from World War I. Put them in a tank and we can do it. And we realize that shrapnel is not the way to go. We need high explosive. So if we're going to do that, abandon the field gun concept entirely and instead embrace the howitzer. And with that, we're going to see that artillery, which realistically World War I, the United States did not do so well on. Most people will say it is American artillery that wins World War II for the United States. We learn the lessons of the past. So what I want to do briefly just to wrap this up is the cool thing about technology is it doesn't go away. I mean, that's why we can still buy VHSs around every now and again. And so what we're going to see is what I'd like to call this is relics from the past. The British tank is started by what was called the Land Ship Committee. And we're going to see that some of those are the idea will still be there. OK, the Soviet T-35. Let's not have one or two or three turrets. Let's have five because that's a good idea. It's not. Okay, no, it doesn't work. But hey, somebody's like, hey, why not? Let's build it. We'll see the French who built super heavy tanks, the FCM Char 2C, having th this idea, okay, let's you know, have a tank for that 1919, 1920 breakthrough. They build it anyway, but they never get rid of it. Even today, this is still the largest, heaviest, well, not heaviest, but the largest operational tank ever built in history. The French build 10 and in 1940 commit them to battle, but it doesn't work because 1918 weaponry does not work against 1940 weaponry. As we're going to see when they even commit venerable old Renault FTs to battle in 1940 and it simply doesn't work. Probably one of the more interesting things of World War I weaponry popping up where you least expect is some Mark V tanks were captured um, in the Russian Civil War by British troops, you know, that were fighting in Russia in the early 20s. And apparently they were captured again by the Germans, who in 1945 threw them into action one final time against the Soviets. Doesn't work, but they try it. We're going to see things like the BAR that the U.S. Army did not want to commit to battle in 1918. It will still be the main U.S. light machine, you know, squad machine gun, and will serve all the way up to about the beginning of the Vietnam War. Speaking of the Vietnam War, that bayonet I showed you, the Pattern 1913, we used it on the 1897 trench gun, because who doesn't want a shotgun with a bayonet on it? Seems like overkill, but why not? Well, this kind of gun was still in the Army inventory. And so in 1966, when the Vietnam War broke out, the United States Army issued more requests for Pattern 1913 bayonets and began building some to send to Vietnam. We're going to see that as early as last year in the Ukraine, Maxim machine guns are still in use. Why? I don't know, but they still are. And probably the last, and what I'd like to end on, the last thing you would probably ever expect, that venerable old Renault FT, some 3,000 made, the main French tank, the first modern tank. In 2003, American troops found one in Kabul, in Afghanistan. I don't know if it works, but the fact that it's there and in good condition just makes you, you know, you got to accept how far and wide does this technology spread and, you know, how, how much of it is still probably in use even to this day. So with that, I thank you for your time. I hope at least a few of you are still awake and, you know, if you have any questions, I would love to attempt to answer them. <laughs> thank you.